Well, she's been bearish on the big banks and the economic recovery for quite a while, but now Meredith Whitney calling for a double dip in housing. She joins us from the Fortune Global Forum in South Africa for more on that and her overall take. Meredith, thanks for being here. Appreciate it. Thank you. I want to get to the housing call first of all. Specifically, what do you think is driving this double dip in housing that you've been talking about lately? Well, for the first quarter uh, in a year, you're starting to see, and you've started to see, banks release inventory onto the marketplace. So they're selling homes, which they had been for the last year, holding and uh, you know trying to rework, modify, um, and they're forcing um, those homes into foreclosure, into short sales. And so you see a supply displacement uh, in the market, and that is what's causing home prices to decline. So the activity that's gone on for the past year within the house market has gone on largely through the first time uh, tax buyers credit. So in fact, 45% of the market was comprised by uh, first time home buyers. Um, what's happening now is you're starting to see some of the prime market, uh, prime real estate come back onto the market. Um, these are typically larger value, um, larger size value mortgages, larger size uh, value homes. Once you see that market move, you'll see real declines in home prices. And you've talked about this expectation of a recovery, but the the fundamentals just not being there to back it up. What's the broader implication here of this double dip in the near term in housing? Well, the broader implication is, and so when I say t you know, 10%, I mean over the next you know, six odd uh, months, uh, you'll see a dr dramatic decline in home prices. Um, but the broader implication is that the investors who thought that uh, the banks were close to normalized earnings, um, would, the investors that thought that the banks would free up capital because of these huge reserve releases, I think are going to be significantly disappointed. What you also see is um, the mortgage market entering in its ninth consecutive quarter of shrinkage. So lending across the board, consumer lending, is shrinking as an industry. Um, that creates problems in terms of uh, just general mobility for consumers, um, free cash flow for cons consumers and certainly um, uh, banks' earnings. Well, what about the employment picture? I mean, you've talked about structural unemployment issues that you don't see getting better anytime soon. You talk about the consumer and leverage issues remaining there. What's your take when it comes to the consumer play and in terms of employment on that front? Well, from a consumer perspective, um, consumer credit is getting tighter, not looser. So small businesses fund themselves just like consumers with credit card lending, with home equity lending, uh, uh, borrowing. Um, and uh, uh, as that market tightens, it's very difficult for small businesses, which has been responsible for over 60% of job creation in this country over the past 15 years, to actually hire. So then that leaves you with the large cap corporates, which also are not hiring. And the government, um, and this is important, state and local governments are starting to really cut jobs. And at this time in the economy, when you're coming out of a recession, this is typically when the government spends a lot of money to hire people um, and create a tailwind, you know, a tailwind. Now this is creating a headwind for the employment picture. So I think uh, the second half of the year is going to be um, uh, harrowing for, for job creation in this country. And what about it in certain states specifically? You've talked a lot about your concerns about the municipal market, calling it very scary, looking at state budget deficits that are just massive, you say worse than, than during the tech bubble, and you look at these states that are in the most dire straits and they're places where the housing picture is the worst. Take California, take Florida. Yeah. Um, the problem that this creates is um, Florida, California have really led the economy, the U.S. economy, for the past 10 years. Um, and since the housing market um, started to um, uh, experience so much disruption, started to decline, these are states that dramatically underperform. So these are the states that are the most underfunded. So what happens is they cut programs, they raise taxes, and or both, and it squeezes the high end and the low end. So your uh, uh, your your state GDP is compromised. And then when it adds back up to the national GDP, um, it becomes a real drag on the economy. So it becomes almost like, a pro the, like the prosipicality of bank reserves. You have to cut at all the wrong time. So you're cutting um, government spend um, just when uh, your, your, uh, uh, your residents need the most assistance. Um, and so it creates a vicious, a vicious spiral. Does the U.S. government have any ammunition left, Meredith, to deal with to deal with this problem? I mean, there's stimulus money left. At the same time, you've got uh, belt tightening in a major way across Europe, and all of that being discussed at the G20. What can the U.S. government do now? 
Well, the U.S. government could give uh, give the states money and bail them out, and that's certainly what uh, Governor Rundell from Pennsylvania is arguing. Um, and if they don't, he says there'll be massive job cuts. I think if they do, there'll still be uh, big job cuts. But uh, the administration is talking about some number around 50 billion. States, by our estimates, are underfunded by about 200 billion. So how you split up the monies between states, it's almost like moral hazard. Why does Illinois need more money than Florida, or why does Illinois get more money? than Ohio. It's going to be very difficult. You won't be able to bail everyone out.